Hello and welcome to an evening with Agatha Christie. It's my pleasure to welcome you from wherever you are around the world. And it seems somehow strangely appropriate that this evening we are gathered in the library to discuss and unravel the story of the Queen of Crime Fiction. Here at the British Library, I am surrounded by thousands, thousands of books. Among them are countless editions of the works of Agatha Christie. Hardly surprising, as it is thought that one billion have been printed to date around the world. She is the most printed and read author of all time, if we leave Shakespeare and the Bible writers aside. They've been translated into over 100 languages. And I like to think perhaps that Christie was more responsible for the image of Britain around the world than almost anyone else, possibly. Her works are essential parts of our culture and our language. Murder on the Orient Express, Death on the Nile, The Mousetrap, and of course, The Body in the Library are etched into our language and culture. And it all began 100 years ago this autumn with the publication of The Mysterious Affair at Styles. Tonight's event is presented with the wonderful collaboration and support of Agatha Christie Limited and is presented in association with HistFest, a new history festival which aims to present events that break the mould of who talks about history and what constitutes history. We begin tonight with a panel entitled The World of Christie with Mark Gatiss, Sarah Phelps and James Pritchard, hosted by Rebecca Rydael, who is the director of HisFest and a noted historian and author. Thank you. Hi, hello everybody and welcome to the first part of our special evening of Ag Agatha Christie festivities. Um, during this first discussion we're going to be looking at Agatha Christie's life, legacy and also the world in which she lived as well and to do this I'm joined by some amazing speakers and Agatha experts. Um, so first of all we have Mark Gatiss who's an award-winning screenwriter actor, producer behind some of the huge BBC shows such as Sherlock and Dracula, but also, crucially for this evening, has written several, written and starred in several episodes of ITV's Poirot with David Suchet. We're also joined by Sarah Phelps, who is the genius behind the recent raft of BBC adaptations um, of Agatha Christie's work. So adaptations such as Ordeal by Innocence, The ABC Murders, and Then There Were None as well. Um, and alongside Sarah and Mark, we're also joined by James Pritchard, who is the CEO and chairman of Agatha Christie Limited, and also the great, great grandson of Agatha Christie herself. He's also overseen numerous adaptations of Christie's work. So Mark, Sarah, James, thank you for joining us this evening. Pleasure. And I guess, first of all, I'm just interested to delve a little bit into Christie's life. And I think the most sensible person to go to, first of all, would be James. And could you tell me a little bit about her background? We know, obviously, she was born in 1890 to an upper middle class family. But could you tell me about her early life and how she first became involved in, in writing? Well, she, I mean, she grew up in Torquay, um, as you say, she was born in 1890, and she had a pretty, um, what you might call a pretty nondescript life. I mean, she wasn't, I mean, you say she was born to an upper middle class family, but I, I wouldn't say by those standards she was, she was wealthy. Um, she had a pretty quiet upbringing um, through to the, I guess, the First World War when um, things started to kick off, both in terms of her private life. She got married to Archie at the beginning of that war. Um, and then at the end of, of that, she had her first book published. And I guess from there, I mean, I guess the rest is history. And one of the, the interesting things is that she did actually take part in, in the First World War as well, didn't she? She was, um, she was involved in the Red Cross during that time, which obviously brought her into close proximity to... Um, well, she, she started off as a nurse and then she um, worked in um, a dispensary uh, for a pharmacist and that that was where her kind of knowledge of, of poisons and those kind of things came from and and that was something she used throughout her life. And 
she obviously her books we as we know you know it's easy easy to say with hindsight that they are a phenomenon they are huge they are i, I believe the the second best selling um source of literature second only to shakespeare and um, but there was a moment in her early life when kind of her her literary output and her personal life collided and that was in 1926 and mark i wonder if i could bring you in here and um, there's a story about an incident where she disappeared. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Are you sure? I know what they say, but I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go on. I wonder if you could tell us about, about this and, um, you know, the, the impact that it, it might have made um, to her popularity and, and that kind of thing. Well, obviously, there's an extra, it's an extraordinary confluence of things, isn't it? She, she publishes The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, which is a masterpiece, I think, and, and kind of changes detective fiction forever. And it coincides incredibly with her, essentially with her disappearance. So, I mean, if 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 you were planning such a thing, you couldn't do it better. I know, I know she didn't, but actually she became the most talked about woman in the, in the country and possibly worldwide whilst releasing her, her, her best book. <laughs> so she disappeared for, for 10 days, I think, and then was found, they, they, they dragged, pools and everything and then uh, they thought she was dead and um it was this huge manhunt and then she was found living under an assumed name in a hotel in Harrogate and no one has ever really known exactly what happened she seems to have entered some kind of fugue state after her husband said he was going to leave her and it's remained an intriguing thing I mean for me personally I think as a child one of my first encounters with her really was probably the film Agatha with Vanessa Redgrave and Dustin Hoffman, which is this fictionalized but rather rather good mystery about what might have happened in that strange period. But um, I suppose something really quite remarkable happened there. You know, she'd she'd done a mysterious affair at style. She'd done a few books, and then this incredible game changer, which of course we can't reveal the end of, Roger Ackroyd. And then at the same time, she became the most famous person in the country. So it sort of all started there, I guess. And then moving on, I suppose, to her writing and her style of writing, Sarah, I was reading an interview with you and you said, and I'll, I'll quote, I'll quote you here. Um, you said that when I, and I quote, when I came to read and then there were none, I was startled and shocked to find that they were in fact brutal. There was a cold and witty mind behind them. Could you tell me about that mind and what that meant to you when you were adapting her work? The thing that stunned me most of all, because as I said before, I'd never read any Agatha Christie before I read and then there were none. I'd never watched any adaptations because I thought they were all going to be a, a cosy kind of here comes a village busybody to sort out a murder. Nobody really cares about the body. It's just conjurings of, you know, plot. And it was, I think that what always really stunned me that there was when I was reading and then there were none. I kept thinking, my God, this is like this is like Aeschylus. This is not a it, cozy little person sort of like this is remorseless this is absolutely brutal and at the same time it's inf I found it really subversive and I kept thinking this is got this really bleak gallows humor behind it all very knowing very like I say subversive and that meant that when I came to read the other books I read for adaptation I could never divorce myself from that first kind of sense of blood thinning shock, which was like having a bucket of icy water dashed in your face and and quite a strict lady shouting, don't you ever take, take me for a fool again. And um, but I always kept thinking that whenever I read anything else, even the work that she wrote before and then there were none, you just kept seeing that kind of, it's like a glint. It's She never kind of puts it front and centre. Well, she does put it front and centre, but some of the times, especially in the later novels, you can see this kind of glint of that of those sharp teeth hiding behind something else and I've got a theory about why that is why it does sort of retreat a little bit but um they'll come to that another time oh you you tease you tease you're gonna have to answer that before the end of this session okay well I'll try anyway it might be a load of old rubbish but we'll see and <laughs> um, but then obviously she has had a huge influence and impact I want to move on to talking about how she has influenced yourselves um, and first of all James I imagine that this is quite a difficult question for you because she's your great grandmother but also 
such a massive literary icon. Was there ever a moment, and I'm assuming it would have been when you were very young, was there ever a moment where you realised, ah, actually, she's Agatha Christie, she's pretty, you know, she's pretty important. How, how, how was that for you? Well, I, 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 I can literally say that if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here. So I, <laughs> I, I think I win this one. Um, <laughs> but, but I, I mean, actually, I mean, well, I, I mean, oddly, or maybe not oddly, I can answer that question quite easily because it was actually, I think, the day she died that I realised quite what she was. I remember coming back from school. Um, I was whatever I was, five or six, and um, uh, my father was kind of lying in a darkened room, obviously very sad, and that wasn't usual at the time. And then um, I remember watching the six o'clock news, and she was the lead item. And I think, I think even then you realised that that wasn't normal. So I suspect that that was the moment that I realised that, you know, she was something more than just my great grandmother. I've always sort of had these two th two people in my life, really. Um, I have Agatha Christie, who, you know, is the person who wrote all the books on the walls behind me and did everything that, you know, we've talked about that these guys have worked on and, and everything else. Um, and then we have the person that we refer to in the family as Nima, who, which is my father's name for her when he couldn't say grandma, um, who was just, I mean, I, I always refer to my father as the most spoiled grandchild of the 20th century. And I don't necessarily mean that financially. I mean that from a kind of love and effect she was the most amazing grandmother she used to take him to places do things with him she was very much there for him i mean his father was killed in the second world war um so you know his mother brought him up to some extent on her own for a while and and she was a very big part of that life and um you couldn't have asked for a better grandmother if you tried that's so interesting when you, when you think about the balance between fam family life and also her prolific outputs I mean was did, did he ever did if you don't mind my asking did he ever speak about the um the her writing processes and um her work in that way well I think the thing about her writing is she I think in the end she wrote very quickly um she talked about it as as a bit like giving birth in that the kind of idea gestated in her head for for weeks and weeks and weeks and presumably she had multiple ideas because she wrote more than one book a year at, at various times. Um, and then when it was ready, it kind of came out fully formed and she wrote longhand, I typed or whatever. I mean, actually she dictated some later novels. Um, and, and I think at that point, they, they came out pretty quickly and pretty fully formed. So she just must have had the most incredible mind, the most incredible brain. Thank you. And Sarah, you've, you've obviously mentioned already that you haven't read any Christie before um, doing your adaptations, but what did, I mean, you, I, I, you know, I came to Agatha Christie later on in, in my life as well. And, but that said, she was always there, wasn't, wasn't she? And I wonder for you, what she meant to you before you, um, you approached the adaptations for the BBC? Uh, mainly what she meant to me was really, really massive queues outside the mousetrap in the West End. I used to run radio mics and in, in, in the West End for um, like Oklahoma and shows like that. So I'd always be bustling about and you'd always be aware of these massive, massive queues outside the mousetrap. I, that's, that's kind of a little bit sort of asinine, actually. I mean, like you're always aware of it. You're aware of Poirot, you're aware of Marple. They're part of your kind of cultural landscape. It's like saying just because I've never been run over by a bus, I don't know what one looks like. And you're aware of, you know, you're aware of David Suchet, you're aware of Joan Hickson, you're, you, and I remember being around my grandfather's one time and there was a, there was Peter Euston of playing Poirot and all the great and the good of Hollywood, you know, um, Glenda Jackson and Maggie Smith kind of being waspish and bitchy, but we never got to see any more of it because we had to get in the car and go home. So you're always aware of it all the time. It's just I was, you know, I was. It was, it was never on the shelves at home. And I think generally when you first start reading that, you know, you're picking up stuff that's on the shelves at home, or you're picking up stuff that's in that's in the library. And I, I was never sort of directed to them, and they were just never there. I mean, there was a whole rack of like Ian Fleming books, you know, like so I read all of James Bond by the time I was about ten years old, which probably you know informs <laughs> quite a lot about the person that I am. So. I think I had a really preconceived notion and a very kind of concrete notion of what the works were. 
very very kind of, but that was what been had been informed by you know oh it's a Sunday afternoon turn on the TV here comes Miss Marple to solve a murder and they always seem to be categorized as something which could either be waspish and bitchy and glittering and delightful or really really solid cozy entertaining tea time drama so that would be fixed in my mind so that when you go it's not that at all it's like watching something being un peeled of its skin it's like watching the English national psyche being flensed slowly and remorselessly I kept thinking this is I mean it's not a disservice because you know it, uh, it, it earns money loads of people enjoy it it's really it's people love it that's just not what I wanted to do with the work at all at all and and you know I don't mean to say that everything has been kind of like cozy and comfortable I think that's the perception of how people come to it I want to be comforted I'm going to watch Poirot solve them you know multiple murders and somehow that's comforting um and I just wanted to so I, I was always really fascinated by the fact that you know that uh because I've done a lot of work and research about the um voluntary aid detachment in first world war and of course she was part of that voluntary aid detachment as a dispensing chemist and had passed all of her exams and I kept thinking about the way she writes and about her looking at I mean, it's a 60 odd year writing career. It's a very, very long life. It is absolutely seismic upheaval. And I always imagine her looking at the sort of like that huge turbulent blood soaked time through the prism of the grain of difference in a drug that can either give life or make it a poison. And that really, really infinitesimal balancing act and just, in, you know, watching a whole landscape of how the 20th century changes the modern warfare, the human body, the human psyche, the economy, the orthodoxies of um, sex, of politics, of power in the world. And just thinking that all of it, she, she kind of, the edge of her pin and she screws it to the board. And that's what I wanted to write about when I was doing my adaptations. Also, why should it be cosy? Someone's dead. Yeah, the hell torn in the universe. Go with that. <laughs> I think that's a lovely visual visual image um, of of the the power of her work. And Mark, you are your whole body of work has been kind of drenched in um, murder mysteries and the macabre. And I just wonder how Agatha Christie comes into that. What? How has she influenced you? Well, I, I read I read most of them when I was a kid on holiday. They, they still feel like holiday books to me, which is like, is the, where they're the best place for them. I think around the poolside somewhere. But I just remember being, you know, it's the same sort of thing. You, you're so aware of them. I remember I remember Margaret Rutherford films and stuff like that. But I was always very into it before I'd read one, and then I just started reading them, and I just simply couldn't stop. I remember literally gasping at the solution of Roger Ackroyd. And things like that. And then an Orient Express was on TV one New Year's Eve. And it was just like, I loved everything about it. But as Sarah says, it's an interesting thing because what she's basically a very broad church, she's like Christie, and, and you can contain many mansions <laughs> within. And there is a there is a very cozy version. There is a more arch version, which is the kind like the Euston of films, which is sort of high camp. That's also Agatha Christie. There's a very straight version, which is sort of Joan Hickson, I think, that kind of version of Miss Marple, et cetera. Uh, and, and, you know, and then much darker readings. And I think, I think you can, you can, it, she can take it all. That's the great thing. Like any great writer, she can take a lot of, she's very, very um, stubborn and rigorous uh, presence, you know. But the, the, the great thing is, um, I think she, uh, not only could she withstand those things, but it's also good. It, it, it keeps it healthy and alive because you're not saying this is some kind of fossil. You're actually trying to keep not only the, the brand going but the, and the sales of the book, but actually to keep people interested in this thing. I mean, there's, to me, the, the, if you boil it down, what she is, is an extraordinary mind. I mean, she had about 35 of the best ideas anyone's ever had. <laughs> for murder mysteries. I mean, it's it's just incredible. There's a stage where you just go, she what she did all those at once, and and she she puts ideas in short stories, which would keep other people going for the rest of their life. It's absolutely amazing. Sarah, did you want to come in there? 
No, I was just at, I was just going to come in on how on, on that she can beat all of these things. And it's yeah. all about kind of investing it all with the real muscularity. And I found that one of the things that was real, really interesting and, uh, and, and I got quite a lot, a fair amount of kickback from some quarters about the way that I sort of read and have adapted her is that it's it's as though somehow I've taken something that that isn't there and it is there it really really is I mean what Mark was just saying about the short stories because um you know when I was doing witness for the prosecution and James sort of said well there's a play and I don't want to do the play that's her second idea let's go with the first and the, some of the stories in that um collection of short of shorts that the uh, witness for the prosecution comes in are phenomenal they're like roll doll and there's mm -hmm. one story the name of which escapes me at the moment i'm sorry which is about you know a, a lost traveler who winds up in a in taking shelter in a in a family's house overnight and it's one of the most disturbing things i've ever met there's a short story about an utterly toxic and terrifying marriage called philomel corner you can't read this and go here's a nice lady she's she's not and yes she can be all of those things she can be high art she can be very very straight reading she can be all of those things but i really i think that underneath there is a deep dark current of going really a, a very i always feel that there's a, certainly as it gets towards the latter end of her career that, that there is a very strong tension between the book she knows people want to read that the agatha christie that this huge global audience wants to read and the book she wants to write and because her life is entire, her writing is entirely made of clues, you really got to be looking hard, focusing on tiny little clues so that when they drop later, you go, oh, yeah, sometimes you find little things in some of the later works, because obviously I did a few of them, where you go, tonally, that feels strange. What is that doing there? And when you kind of follow a particular little kind of narrative clue that doesn't seem to quite fit, you go down into a sort of rabbit hole and go, oh, is this a book she wants to write? So I, that was always the sort of way I came to her sort of adaptations, looking for the clues which don't quite seem to tonally fit with the rest of the book. But yeah, sorry, I, just, I went off on one there. No, that's really interesting. And James, it's just made me think about your unique position um, in the Agatha Christie story. And I wonder about your reading of her works and whether you have a favourite and how, how you first approach your great grandmother's um, writing. I mean, I, well, I've, I've always said, well, not always said though, because it, it happened more recently, but, but Sarah has changed my, the way I read the work. <laughs> she's taught me a lot. Poor man. <laughs> <I> know, but, <laughs> but she's taught me a lot about them. And I think one of the things I'm incredibly grateful for Sarah about is that She's taken the work seriously um, and and has adapted that what she sees. Now, it's not what everyone sees, because thank God for the rest of us, not everyone sees in the world what Sarah sees in the world. But, um, <laughs> but, but she has she has done her job of adapting the books. And I think going back to Mark's point, you know, there are lots of different ways of of relating to Agatha Christie. Um, and I mean, I I think the more serious view is actually probably the right view. I think that that slightly cosy um, and particularly the, the kind of what I, the, the maybe the more Euston off view is probably not the way, certainly I don't think the way she wrote them. I think she wrote them as serious. She certainly felt that the deaths were real, that murder yeah. was a horrific thing and, and people should be punished for murder. I mean, I think without, you know, giving any spoilers away, you know, perhaps she let one or two, or in one or two books, should I say, one or two murderers are, are, are sort of allowed to get away with it to some extent. But that is that is all out of, you know, however many stories. And there are some pretty horrific people who get killed in Agatha Christie's, but that is still unjustifiable. She does not think that murder is an acceptable answer to someone living a bit long, being a bit of a pain in the neck and, and having a lot of money. Um, she, you know, she abhorred that. So, look, I, 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 I read them, you know, I reread them kind of relatively regularly. My, if I have a, I don't, I don't really have a favourite, I guess. Um, I, li I like lots of them for different things. I mean, I love things like And Then There Were None and Death on the Nile and Murder on the Orient Express because there's a reason why they're the most famous. But I also like some of the lesser novels, like Sarah. I think some of the later novels are really interesting in, in, in what they're doing. Um, books like Crooked House, like Pale Horse, like Endless Night, they say something about 
a different world. And I, I think what Sarah says is right. I think by then she was, you know, there's a reason why so many of them don't contain, contain Poirot and Marple. I think it was when she had the, the courage to say to her publishers, no, you're not getting a Poirot or a Marple this year. I'm writing what I want to write. Um, so yeah, I, you know, but I, I think that's the thing is you can, you know, you can read a book one day and go, that's my favorite. And then you read something else the next. And, you know, there's something, you know, one of the amazing things is how, how actually so many of them are so good. Um, you know, there are very few which are even less good than, than even the best ones. I mean, there are one or two maybe later on where she got a little bit whatever, but on the whole, they're pretty strong all the way through. Um, and I guess the, I guess the other thing that we we've not really noted as well is how the Christie influence expands beyond books, beyond TV adaptations. So we have things like well, Cluedo, and we have um, you know murder mystery weekends that people go on. I think you can draw, you can you know trace a, a very clear line and um, back from them towards towards Christie's work. I'd like to move on to um, some of the more challenging as aspects of adapting Christie's novels now. So obviously we've spoken about the, the cultural context in which she, which she grew up and which she was writing. We know that she had an, a keen interest in archaeology. She traveled to Egypt and things like that. Um, Mark, perhaps I'll start, I'll start with you first. Are there, you know, given all of this, are there unique challenges that present themselves when adapting a work from an author whose body of work is in a very specific time period? And how do you, and how do you deal with that? Um, I don't know about that. I mean, again, there's a sort of, you know, there's a joy in, in doing things set in that period because, I mean, there was a, that was the, the sort of diktat with, with the Suchet, Sir David, indeed. Uh, mm. Uh, it was that they were all essentially set in 1936. It was a very busy year for Kubara. <laughs> a lot it, kind of of all, <laughs> it, made a, it made a lot of sense because it was all about, you know, the, the joy of that period and, and the, the art deco-ness of it. And we all, that, all that absolutely made sense. I don't think it's, it's not, it's not time specific. It's just that that's the kind of golden age, just now, you know. Um, I mean, for me, the, the principal thing really is the reason that Christie has survived and all her competitors have fallen away, she really is the queen, is, you know, Dorothy L. Sayers, uh, they're gorgeous books, those. Whimsy's a beautiful character. It's very moving, his kind of First World War flashbacks and all that, but nobody remembers the plots, nobody. They're just not, they're just not the same. And I think what Christie really triumphs at, and when you're adapting, is a gift is if the actual mechanics of the story are absolutely copper bottom brilliant. Um, and interesting, the ones I did were, were later books, you know, regarded as not the, not the greatest, but there were still so many lovely things to mine, you know, I mean, if, if you're, as Sarah has, if you're approaching something like ABC, which is just an absolutely dynamite idea, you know, then it's all there, isn't it? And, and, you, you can enjoy ringing the change and everything, but the, the idea is so crystal and brilliant. But, but for instance, something with like, um, uh, I did uh, uh, Cats Among the Pigeons and one of the main things was there were actually two murderers. I've given that away. <laughs> and, uh, oh. and, I know, but, but it was like, this is a really clever idea. It was just really clever, lovely setting. And, and I felt I could have, you know, tons of fun with it. It's a, it's a girls' school in the 30s. There's very colourful teachers to play with and all sorts of stuff like that. So, I mean, that in, in, in many ways, that, that all that's a gift. And I think what I tried to do really, I suppose, was channel all those different influences, the, 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 the sort of more arch version, which is kind of cosy and fun, plus the actual darkness of, of people getting their heads smashed in, whatever. And, and, and that's what, I suppose that's what we all enjoy about it, isn't it? Um, but it's, uh, you know, you're, you know you're in safe hands, really. That's a, that's a lovely thing. You, you think, well, you know, you're not, you're not messing with anything, really, because, because she's done it all for you. And I don't know, I don't know how true this is, but it was written in um, Christie's obituary um, that, and I quote here, she never cared much for the cinema or for wireless and television. Um, <laughs> and Sarah, obviously, you know, you've, you've, you've made a very impactful um, 
mark on the Christie legacy, I think, in the way that you've adapted her works. And you have, in a way, changed, changed the tone and the way, that it, the way that her books feel on screen, um, at the very least. Was that a conscious decision or was that something that just happened organically? It was just something that just happened because I was so shocked by and then there were none. Yeah. And it was while I was writing that um, and thinking about how remorseless it is, you know, and then thinking about, well, she writes, obviously she's got a huge audience, thirsty, gagging for what comes next. So she writes very, very fast and publishes very fast. And then, and then there were none, it's written in the summer of 1939. And it's published in, in pretty much, yeah, it's finished and published then. And as I was reading, I kept thinking, you could re you can read this in so many different ways. Locked room murder mystery, portrait of a psychopath, disquisition on the nature of guilt, or the portrait of a country represented by all these kind of ludic figures, you know, the general, the playboy, the spinster, the school teacher, on this salt scoured island where they can't see anyone and no one can see them and this remorseless oblivion heading towards them. Doesn't matter, you can't, there's no mitigation, you can't plead, you're not gonna be let off, there's no leniency. It is coming and it is going to smash you. It's over, the remorseless, white, unblinking eye of God is on you. And I kept thinking, Christ, doesn't this feel like standing on the edge of the world about to be catapulted into the next great destructive, bloodbath of World War II after you've just struggled out of the last one. And I kept thinking, I wonder if there's a way of doing a quintet where you could look at sort of like five periods of the British history, the English history of when, when she was writing through the absolute prism of the sort of genre that she made her own, which is murder mystery, which has always been viewed as a sort of slightly, not particularly a literary genre, let's be honest, a bit kind of, um, oh, well, the ladies will enjoy that one. It's not kind of like serious and heavy hitting. And doing something that says, let's look through the eyes of this author, let's look at five decades of, you know, the blood-soaked, tumultuous 20th century. And so um, when I was sort of like looking at that, I never had the consciousness of wanting to say, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have people swear I'm going to have them take drugs and I'm going to have them have sex because that's the only way to make an audience sit up. No, if you're in an island and everyone starts dying, you're going to swear and you're going to have sex because that's what you do if you're on the lip of the grave and you thought you might die tomorrow and there's one person with a gun who could keep you alive. Of course you're going to boff him. And, um, and you know, drug use was rife anyway and I just I just thought one of the other things that was really conscious in me because at the time you know we, we had this whole kind of like let's vote every we're going to shoot ourselves in the face for a nostalgia that never existed and I always think that one of the dangerous things about presenting the kind of past in a sort of cozy way where Englishness is tied up and like look how safe it is it's all nice is that it makes you feel that the past was everybody knew their place and everybody was happy it wasn't like that at all and it was when you kind of, um, you, you know, when you look at the sort of the, the way that, for example, and then there were none presents its characters, you know, like I was saying, all these people sound like they could characters on the, in a board game and they're all English and everybody speaks with the same accent and everybody knows who the other person is. They think and then they find out Jesus Christ, you're a murderer and you've been getting away with it and it hasn't bothered you. There's no red mark of Cain upon your brow. If it wasn't for the fact that it brought you to this place and made you start to sweat, you'd have been fine. You'd have been carrying on living. And in 1939, to have the look at sideways at somebody who you should be trusting because they're like you and have them go, who the hell are you? Made me think this is completely subversive. So all of these ideas are what kind of informed how I wrote. I never wanted to think like, oh, let's make it, let's let's go and like really be deliberate about something. If you're deliberate about something, it stands out a mile, it's cheap, it's tawdry, and it doesn't have its roots in anything real. So I never had that, I just plowed into the books. And I didn't, what my rule of thumb when, when adapting is I never watch any other adaptation. All I go in is the book and what the book tells me. So whatever is on screen, is what the book has told me. 
That's really interesting because it must be incredibly hard not to have seen um, a Christie adaptation. And Mark, when you were writing, oh, book, apart from apart from the final curtain, the last Suchet, that the last Suchet, which was Kevin Elliott wrote the adaptation for. Do you know the one, Mark? Yes, yes. And absolutely phenomenal. So that I that I have seen, which means that I. If somebody said to me, do you want to adapt, you know, Last Curtain, I'd go, no, because I don't want to ever mm -hmm. tread on anything that Kevin Elliott has ever done, because it's a really masterly, elegiac piece of work, yeah. and Suchet is fantastic in it. It's really wonderful. So, yeah, but I avoid, like, the play. Sorry, sorry Mark, I was trod on you. No, Mark, <laughs> I, was, I was just wondering about your, when you um, came to write the, came to write Poirot, Poirot I should say, had you watched any adaptations before i'm assuming yes um, and how and if you had how did that the question should be your question should be how many times did i watch adaptations? <laughs> <laughs> i mean well i grew up with so many of them you know hickson and then obviously with the poirots and everything and when i was in poirot an extraordinary thing happened it's a very personal thing but i got married whilst i was making shooting poirot appointment with death and David, the day before the ceremony, David came over in full costume and blessed me. And it was it was a ridiculously moving experience because it was kind of like all my Sunday nights blessing me, you know. It was something it's very, so very lovely. It was, it was something very strangely moving about it. It was just like, gosh, this is like Sunday coming back and kissing you on the forehead. <laughs> anyway, um, no, I mean I had I was very aware of, I just love them, you know, the Rene Claire. And then there were none, and uh, the Finney Orient Express and stuff. I love, I love them all, really. But I mean, there are and there are different, different gradations. You know, you can enjoy the, the absolute horror of the other two, um, and then there were nones from the fifties and seventies, which are just dreadful. <laughs> but they have, they have a kind of, they have something about them because the source material is so good. You didn't think, how have you managed to mess this up so badly? Which they did, but. Um, so, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's the same as, as enjoying the books in different ways. It's, a, it's very, she's very robust. So you can watch some less good adaptations and still enjoy them. I mean, weirdly, the Rutherfords, of course, are mostly adapted Poirots, which is absolutely outrageous, but they're very enjoyable films. And she's a delightful presence. She's not really Miss Marple. She's just Margaret Rutherford solving mysteries. But I mean, I would watch that. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I, I I was very familiar really with them, and therefore it was it was a joy to be asked, you know. And I guess can I just can I just jump in on something? Yeah. Um, you know, just talking about not watching other adaptations. That after I'd done, and then there were none. I think I was on to um, witness for the prosecution um, by this point, and as usual, I'd I'd, jumped, I'd had some wine had been taken, and I'd fallen asleep on the sofa with the telly on, and I woke up and the the TV was blaring and Oliver Reed was running about oh, yeah. wearing a huge turtleneck jumper and carrying a gun and with this sort of half naked actress and sort of like dodging behind pillars and everything and then suddenly Dickie Attenborough was there with cobweb, cobwebs in his eyebrows. Like, what the bloody hell is this? And at some point I realized, oh my god, <laughs> yes. it's and then there were none but it's a <laughs> film version where Lombard and Vera get away with it based on the kind of like the stage adaptation that she'd written for New York post-World War II, to which I'll come back if you ask. But, and I was watching it going, this, this is insane. I mean, just from the sort of like the costume decision, but it took me ages to work out what it was. It just like, oh, this is a thing I've just finished writing. Yes, but, it yeah. unrecognisable. <laughs> completely. Um, James, one of the themes that, that strikes me about Christie's output specifically from her two most well-known characters, so Poirot and, and Miss Marple, is this idea of an outsider stepping into somebody else's life, well, a, a group of people's lives. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit and how important that theme is in, in her works. Um, I mean, there's, I mean, the, the kind of basis of most of her works are kind of closed circles. So, you know, the, the kind of genesis of the country has, <clears throat> mystery model is that kind of thing of a bunch of people who know each other in a house one of them dies you know who did it it had to be someone in there no one could have come from outside and and all that kind of thing and therefore to to solve it you need I mean on the whole you need someone who comes in from outside and I think she 
very cleverly, probably, you know, Poirot kind of almost, I guess, happened by accident, certainly to the scale he did. He wasn't planned to be the long running character he turned out to be. Um, you know, he was kind of a late addition to Mr. Mysterious Affair at Styles. But to, to create someone who was so other, um, who was, you know, not just not from that kind of country house set, but he was also, you know, from not the UK, he was from Belgium, um, I think was incredibly clever. Um, and then Miss Marple's a kind of whole different kettle of fish. I mean, she is sort of from that world, but she does sit just outside it in a very interesting way and therefore can judge it and watches it and she observes in a way that you know very few people did I suspect that she observes people in the way that my great-grandmother observed people I think that is definitely something she inherited from that so you know there is that um, I'm aware Sarah's got come in Sarah. I was just going to say that one of the things that I love about it is that her two most famous sleuths are outsiders one is a refugee fleeing war, the other one is a spinster. And it's basically, you stand, it's like the, um, the Shakespearean fool. You stand outside of everything and you comment on it. And in terms of sort of like the English country house being presented as the site of murder, I would have always thought, well, that's Christie's sly joke. Yeah, which is, well, this is where it all happens, isn't it? This, where, is it? this is where somebody draws a line on a map that sends a load of boys over into a kind of land where they're just going to be cut down by the enfilade. It's very, it, I always think that's a sly joke about the, the sort of like the seats of power from Christie. And even though, you know, she was quite an habitué of the English country house anyway, I do think that everything is sly, a sideways kind of subversive little dig, which is like, this is where all the power is. Here's a body on the floor. Nobody seems to really mind, but it's so important. And here comes the outsider, the unmarried woman, the Belgian refugee. And their job, it seems to be to parcel up Englishness and give it back to you with something safe, but nothing's ever going to erase that bloodstain. I think that's her point. I, I, I really like that. I'm very conscious that we are, um, we only have a few more minutes left and I've got a couple of questions I'd like to, to ask um, all three of you, but I'll ask them together and hopefully you can um, give, me, give me, there's enough time for you to give me your answers. So first of all, what are the key ingredients for a Christie story? And second to that, Who's your, what's your favourite, what has been your favourite adaptation? Mark, I'll start with you. Key ingredients, I mean, that's hard because, you know, she, as I say, she had so, she had so many brilliant ideas. She rings the changes all the time. And, and there is a, to some extent, it's like, she's presenting herself with the problem, isn't she? What, what can I do different? And then, you know, I do this, you can't say anything without giving anything away <laughs> but she rings she does it so breathtakingly um i suppose it's really as much uh, as james says it's a sort of close circle i mean that's just that's just what you need the more disparate it becomes the more difficult it is and then you need to have someone in on the investigation but i suppose what she really does is it's brilliant sleight of hand she 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 just when you think you know how she does it, she tricks you again. And that's, that's like a master conjurer going, ah, ah, ah. And, and if you think, oh, I know how she, yes, this is a pattern. And then she just switches it again. She's always ahead, I think. And that's a wonderful thing. But I mean, it's what I was saying about the puzzles, I think is very important. They are puzzle books, but what she does sometimes, I think unconsciously, is smuggles in a lot of social commentary because of the time she's writing, sometimes much more consciously. And as Sarah says, she's sly. There's a sly humour, uh, but it doesn't get, it doesn't detract from the puzzle, but it just gives you a wonderful picture. And I think sometimes people criticise her for being too sort of plain or, you know, but there's a, there's a wonderful kind of clarity to it. It's really, uh, there are some, you know, obviously working with archetypes, but you, you just think, well, I know where I am and this is really now all laid out for me and and if I don't guess it then then it's because I'm not as clever as she is you know? <laughs> and my favorite adaptation oh my goodness I would have to say hand on my heart because I watch it at least six times a year it's and it has everything for me it has to be the use of evil under the sun which I think is the best way of having a good time you can have <laughs> in the cinema <laughs> it's an absolute glory it's a brilliant way of taking you know, quite a, quite a serious book and having massive fun with it, casting it to the, to the nines, and yet 
taking all the detection very seriously. It's, it's a really satisfying hole because you just go on holiday with Diana Rigg and Maggie Smith and Peter Ustinov <laughs> and also solve a brilliant mystery at the same time. It's a glorious thing. Thank you. And James, you're, you're the key ingredients for a Christie story and your favourite adaptation. Well, I think Mark's sort of covered it, but my, my, my phrase is always, <laughs> it's the plots. It's, it's, she had this mastery of plots and somehow she managed to write you know, 66 full length novels, whatever it is, 150 short stories, 20 odd plays without really repeating herself, without making any mistakes, without having any, I mean, yes, some of the stories may be a little bit far fetched in some ways, but but they actually work. They're not, you know, there's, there's it, it, they don't have errors in them. And, and that is why it lasts. That's why we're still doing them because the kind of, the, the kind of structure is there to adapt them for whatever time and to, to put your spin on them um, that, that you want to. So, you know, I think it, it does come back to the fact that she just wrote these incredible stories as she would have called them. Um, and that is what we all still enjoy and people enjoy all over the world because you can read them in any language. You can read them if you're, you know, if English isn't your first language necessarily, but also they work in translation and they work being adapted in, in foreign languages as well. So yeah, it's the stories. And your adaptation. Well, I mean, this may sound as if I'm trying to be nice to Sarah, but I do. And then there were none has a very special place in my heart. Um, it, it came out. I, I can say this because I had absolutely nothing to do with it, um, except it did come out just as I took over as chairman of this business from my father. So I kind of felt I felt attached to it in that way. But I wasn't in, I wasn't involved in its genesis. And I think it just did something very interesting for us. It, it did make people look at her writing in a different way again. I mean, we had, and, and don't get me wrong, I love the Suchets. I mean, Curtain is, as Sarah's mentioned, I think one of one of the great films that, that we've done of all types, let alone the fact that it was, well, it was shown as the last of, you know, a series of however many. Um, but, you know, we'd had all of, we'd, we'd done of all the Poirots, we'd done all the Marples. And, you know, we were at that point going, are we ever going to make TV again? And suddenly Sarah comes along with, with this take on and then the one on and it just feels so different, so modern, so alive, but it is also incredibly faithful to the story. Um, and and it, 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 it looks at it in a different way. And I think that really helped me on my way in the business. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go with Sarah and then, then there were none. And Sarah, we've just got a couple of minutes, but you, your turn to answer the question. The key ingredients. Key ingredients. A sickening, disgraceful sense of shame. A terrible thing done that you will do anything never to face. That's a key ingredient. Absolute taproot in any of the darkest, darkest recesses of the thing that you're trying to forget. Power and how much somebody, what they'll do to hang on to it. Those are really, really key ingredients. And also the sense of the world whirling around you. These people don't just step onto a board from nowhere, they step from somewhere. That's really important. That's, those are the crucial things. Besides everything else, besides everything else, that sickening feeling of shame and also of want. I want this, I want this, what will I do to get it? I don't want this, this is how far I will go to stop it from happening crucial elements. My favourite adaptation? Well, I don't know, and I'm not going to sort of talk about anyone. I think Curtin has got to be up there as being absolutely profound. But also, can I just give a quick plea to the adaptation that I haven't written yet and don't know if I ever will, that's kind of up to James, which is one of her short stories and one of the greatest, greatest short stories, which is called The Mystery of the Blue Jar. It's one of the nastiest, most cruel, most heartbreaking, heartrending, astonishing, Astonishing short stories that will thick your blood with cold, to use Antonia by its phrase. It's really, really marvellous. And if you don't know it, I really just recommend that you read it. It's from the collection that The Witness Prosecution comes from. It's an early short story and it's staggering. So it's not an adaptation, but it's one I'd like to do. Well, there you go, James. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure's on. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, Mark, Sarah, James, thank you so much for your time you. this evening. It's been my amazing. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Mark, to Sarah, to James and to Rebecca. In a few moments, we present the second panel of this evening, Christie and Crime Fiction. In the meantime, you may be interested to know that the British Library has its own crime fiction imprint 
crime classics which unearths forgotten gems from the golden age of crime fiction. If you'd like to explore further, please click the tab entitled Books at the top of your page. Thank you. We now present the second panel of this evening's Evening with Agatha Christie, here from the British Library in association with Histfest and Agatha Christie Limited. The panel entitled Christie and Crime Fiction features three of our leading contemporary crime fiction writers, Sophie Hanna, Rachel Hazel Hall and Vazian Khan, again hosted by Rebecca Rydell. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the second of our panel discussions this evening. Um, to, now we're going to be looking at Agatha Christie and crime fiction as a genre. So 100 years ago um, this year, Agatha Christie published her first novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, and introduced us to one of her most famous characters, Poirot. Over her lifetime, she's published 66 detective novels, 14 short story collections, and has become one of the biggest, well, actually, sorry, the biggest selling author of crime fiction, full stop. Um, to explore crime fiction and Christie's work and how it's influenced crime writers, I'm joined by an amazing panel of speakers. So we have Sophie Hanna, who's the best-selling writer of, well, who is a best-selling writer of crime fiction herself. Um, her 2013 novel, The Carrier, won the Crime Crime Thriller of the Year Award. She's also the author of four highly acclaimed Poirot mysteries herself. Um, alongside Sophie, we also have Rachel Housel Hall, um, who's a critically acclaimed author of crime fiction as well, whose work includes the, includes the Detective Eloise Norton series and the Christie inspired They All Fall Down. Fall Down. She serves on the board of directors for the Mystery Writers of America. And joining Rachel and Sophie, we also have Vasim Khan, who is the author of the best-selling and award-winning Baby Ganesh Detective Agency novels, which are set in modern-day India, and they feature a detective named Ashwin Chopra, um, and this, and in homage to Christie, um, the most recent novel in the series is called The Last Victim of the Monsoon Express. So, Sophie, Rachel, and Basim, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I guess the first thing I want to want to really ask you about are your own novels, because you've all done something very different with the, the crime fiction genre. Um, Vasim, you've taken the concept of the Orient Express to India. Um, Rachel, you've taken the spirit of And Then There Were None to modern day L.A. And Sophie, you've actually taken on the voice of another author by writing Poirot novels. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your journey into crime fiction and the books that you write. If I start with the theme. Right, so, um, so one of the things that you quickly realise if you're trying to break into crime fiction is that you have to do something different. It is a, the world's most popular genre now, but it's also incredibly crowded. Uh, so for me, because I'd lived in India for a decade, I wanted to write about India. And I personally think, uh, as do many crime authors, that crime fiction is a really good vehicle for exploring social issues. And that's what I do with the Baby Ganesh uh, agency series. So you have Chopra, who is in his late 40s, he retires from the Bombay police force, uh, but he also inherits a one-year-old baby elephant at the same time. So the elephant is a metaphor, it's a symbol for India. It allows me to add uh, some subtle humour throughout the series, but what we're doing is we're exploring India as it is. But the inspiration for some of the stories in that, not just um, the last victim of the Monsoon Express, but the uh, another novel in the series called Murder at the Grand Raj Hotel, uh, which again is a very Agatha Christie style, uh, death in the Nile kind of vision where Chopra is called in after the murder of a wealthy American at this uh, premier Indian hotel based on the real Taj Hotel in Bombay. And she do he does what uh, Christie's Poirot would do. He goes around, number of suspects come to the fore, and then we have a big denouement when he gathers everybody together and we find out who, uh, who committed the murder. And for me, the inspiration for that came from my, my younger days because I grew up in Britain. My parents were born in the subcontinent, came to the UK. I was born here. We grew up here. And I remember in, our, in my teens, the only thing that the entire family would watch together was uh, the Poirot adaptation starring David Suchet. And that was quite amazing to me because my father couldn't even speak English very well, but he just loved seeing this very quintessentially English uh, TV show with this English, uh, not English, but uh, the, the 
the, the, the setting was English, but the detective, were, and with his quirks and his mannerisms, something about that appealed to him. And I think that stayed with me throughout the years, so that as I, as I started to write crime fiction, I couldn't help but be influenced by, by Christie. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. It seems to be a running theme, and it was mentioned in the um, the panel discussion earlier about how that ITV Poirot series has been so um, formative for so so many people's experience of experiences of Christie. Rachel, turning to you. So in in America, Christie's just as huge as she is here. Um, how did you how did you come to crime fiction? What was the inspiration behind your stories, and how does Christie play into that? Right. I came into Christie pretty late in life. Um, growing up, you know, in America and as a Black American, it wasn't, she wasn't much of a force in our world because just, just because. Uh, my mom did actually, she watched Masterpiece Theater, which was a PBS show, which had lots of adaptations of Christie novels into movies. And so I, I knew about her, but I didn't understand what the big deal was. Um, when my husband and I first started dating, um, he watched, he loved one of his favorite movies was Murder by Death, which is a Neil Simon movie with all the satire of, you know, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Agatha Christie, and these characters. And it was really funny. I'm like, well, who is the little lady supposed to be? And that's when I went back and discovered Agatha Christie. I was an English American literature major, but we did not read Agatha Christie. We did the usual, you know, English canon that did not include genre writers because oh, genre writers, they, they don't matter. Um, so after watching Murder by Death, I started kind of digging. I was like, oh, she's kind of cool. I like these stories. And, you know, I read And Then There Were None, and I like that one a lot. And I saw it in different books that I'd read. It's like, oh, that stems from a Christie story. Oh, Murder on the Orient Express. Oh, I've seen that kind of around. Um, and so I thought to myself, you know, I would like to see an African-American woman in this kind of uh, milieu. I wanted to see, you know, something very uniquely American and in Black American in a Christie novel because, you know, Black folks aren't in locked room uh, mysteries. And so I wanted to take my favorite story, which was, and then there were none, and have it be led by an African-American woman in first person and knowing that it's first person and knowing what the story's ending was, it's like, okay, how am I going to do this? And then also take, as Fasim said, social issues and have them em embodied by certain especially very American types of people. So it was a challenge, it was fun. Um, I, I used all of my, you know, what I've learned in my formal education on how to write this book. And, and it turned out cool. I, I had fun writing that ending. <laughs> <laughs> and then so, Sophie, um, how did you come to crime fiction then? Because you do a lot of different things, but um, crime fiction seems to be the running thread. Yeah, so I became absolutely obsessed with mystery fiction, uh, which is crime fiction, but the thing that I love is the mystery. Uh, and I became obsessed with mysteries as a very, very young child. I was maybe about six or seven, and I discovered Enid Blyton's uh, Secret Seven books. I did read The Famous Five as well, but The Secret Seven were my, my passion. So I read all of those. And it's about, you know, they're all about a gang of kids who solve mysteries before the, the boring, stupid grown-ups who always get it wrong. And I just fell in love with them. And then when I was just getting to the point where I was too old to read Enid Blyton, and I, I was about 12, I'd read all of Enid Blyton's mysteries, my dad bought me a copy of The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie. He used to go to lots of secondhand book fairs, and he knew I liked mysteries, so he saw this copy of Body in the Library, which is an excellent Miss Marple novel. And he just bought it on spec thinking, oh, well, she might like this. And I read it age 12 and thought, this is everything I have been wishing for in my wildest dreams. Because what I'd been hoping for was to find kind of Enid Blyton mysteries for grown-ups, And that was what Agatha Christie seemed to me to be. So between the ages of 12 and 14, I read every word that Agatha had published. 
And by the time I was 14, I was one of the world's leading experts on Agatha Christie. <laughs> and like, it just set up in my brain the blueprint for what the ideal novel should be and do. And, you know, it, it made me, it just sort of reaffirmed my love of the mystery genre. And ever since then, it has been my absolute favourite thing to read and my absolute favourite thing to write. And I love in particular that combination of the frustration of being desperate to know the answer and not knowing the answer, combined with an absolute guarantee that you will know the answer. Because <laughs> in real life, I'm a very curious person. Some might say nosy, but I would not. I would say curious. And very often, if there's a mystery in real life and I'm desperate for the answer, I have to accept that I might never get it. Whereas in crime fiction, you know that you are going to get that moment of satisfaction where you go, now I understand how it all fits together. And that, that's what I most love. Well, that, that links really nicely onto my next question, actually. And um, I remember reading somewhere, probably erroneously, I must confess and hold my hands up to it. But um, I remember reading somewhere that um, Christy sometimes used to leave the dis the decision as to who was the main culprit until the final chapter and um, so that she could choose the most unlikely person uh, unlikely character to have committed the crime whether this is true or not and um, I'm interested in the way crime writers carve out stories that feel authentic and true and at the end readers go ah of course of course it's that person and um, I, I wonder if you could um, perhaps tell me a little bit about that and your techniques for doing it. If we start with Rachel. Um, I like earning every twist I, I, I give a reader. <laughs> and I like planting the seeds very early on. I want to tell you basically who did it, but with this hand, say she did it, but with this hand, do all kinds of crazy things like magic. I want to... When you get to that end, I can say, well, I told you in chapter two who it was. You just didn't, you know, you didn't pay attention or you were, were so excited to plow ahead. Um, I like um, when a reader gets to the end, there's some sort of satisfaction that only if I had only paid it more attention or thought more about that over there, I would have solved it. I don't want it to be very, I don't want it to be a, a Scooby-Doo reveal. You guys know Scooby-Doo, right? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I want it to be like this fully formed and uh, very honest uh, reveal. Uh, and that takes time. That takes draft after draft for me, planting seeds in every chapter about who this is. And we were talking earlier about first drafts. And how I hate first drafts because I myself, I don't know what's going to happen. Even if I have an outline, we all know that ideas sink sometimes outside of that idea of, of, of what you have. And it's around the third draft where I am totally convinced of who done it. And then I get to go back and make sure that it's, it, it's um, evident in every chapter I write. That's interesting. And Sophie, do you have a similar approach or do you, do you differ in how you carve out a story? Well, I, I would not like to wait till the last chapter to, to decide who did it, because I, I, I mean, I agree with, with uh, Rachel. I think we as writers are better able to cleverly misdirect the reader and plant the clues and yet, and write things so that we know that the reader will interpret it in this way, but we really know that it means that all of that sort of setting up, setting the stage to make the revelation when it's time can only really be done if you, the writer, know exactly what's going on from the start. Now, that's not true if you are willing to do endless rewriting. So I could imagine going a lot, but you see, I couldn't actually, because I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know how to write chapter one or chapter two or chapter three if I didn't know what story those chapters were part of. So I have huge admiration for crime writers who can start writing their crime novels, not knowing any of the plot beyond what they're writing in that moment. I have huge admiration for, for all the many writers who say they do that and pull it off admirably. But personally, 
I like to know everything so that I can then decide how to portray things and reveal things and misdirect. And I can't imagine being able to do that without knowing up front. Um, yeah. And Vasin, um, how, how about you? Did, where do you fall in this? Um... Well, I'm going to act as a tiebreaker here and I, I'm going <laughs> to fall on Sophie's side of the, of the fence. And I'm going to go back to something she said a couple of minutes ago, which is the mystery element of crime fiction, because I think more than anything else, the kind of crime fiction that I write is about the mystery element. Uh, and at the other spectrum of crime fiction, you have fast paced adventure thrillers uh, where the mystery is less. It's much more about the, the, the action and, and all, of that, all of those kind of things. So for me, it's the intellectual challenge that you're giving to uh, a reader uh, so that in tandem with you, they go through the plot and they solve this mystery, hopefully. And if not, they at least get that great payoff at the end where they scratch their head and say, oh God, I missed that clue and otherwise I would have solved it. And to do that, in my opinion, and certainly the way that I work is to start with the crime, usually a murder. And then I ask myself the four main questions, how, what, why, and when, when did this happen? Why, what, would, what is the motivation for this person dying? Um, how, how was the murder committed, et cetera, et cetera. Once you know all of those things, that's when you can go back backwards, or at least the way that I do it, I would then go backwards and start thinking, right, now who else can I justifiably put as a red herring here? What clues can I put to point to somebody other than the person that I know who did this? And then I go back and say, now how can I make these clues interesting? How can I make them an intellectual puzzle for, for the readers uh, to follow? And Sophie's been brilliant at doing that with her new... Uh, New Pro Mysteries. I think the first one started with three. Uh, was it earrings that you that you put into people's mouths? That, um, cufflinks. Cuff, cufflinks that were put into people's mouths. Now that kind of small clue, that's an intellectual challenge because it immediately asks the reader to ask themselves, why in the world would a murderer leave these cufflinks in these three dead bodies' mouths? So that for me is the way that I I would approach this going backwards and then making it intellectually stimulating. Okay, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm getting the impression here from all three of you as well that there must be some kind of little buzz that you get as authors that you can't share with anyone at the time when you've created a really great red herring and you know it, <laughs> but you have to keep it to yourself. And I was going to ask you about your favorite ones, but I can't, of course, <laughs> I will leave it. <laughs> um, the, next, the next question I had, um, which I think is a key attribute to most crime fiction is the central character, whether they're a, you know, a police detective or they're someone working on the outside, kind of looking at a case um, happening elsewhere. So I'm interested to know about the key attributes of the crime fiction detective or sleuth, if you like. Um, Sophie, I think I'll start with you because you because I also want to push you a little bit on the question I asked you before, um, with regards to writing using someone else's voice. So if, if you could tell me about Poirot and um, how, how you came to um, channel Christie in your writing. Yeah, well, first of all, to, in terms of what you just said about the, the characteristics a detective should have, I don't think there is a set of characteristics. I think, you know, as long as your detective character is doing whatever you want him to do or her to do successfully, you know, Poirot is a very flamboyant detective, but, um, you know, Ruth Rendell's Inspector Reg Wexford, he's not so flamboyant. He's more a sort of good, responsible, ordinary, ordinary man. Inspector Morse is very sort of bad tempered and he likes his opera. So like, I don't think there's, one set of characteristics that detectives in fiction should have. Um, I tend to particularly like, especially now in contemporary crime writing, detectives where I think this is an unusual, you know, this is just a person that I haven't met before who happens to be a detective, rather than here's a, an author who sat down and thought, I'll create a detective and given them all the characteristics that they think detectives should have, because that leads to very hackneyed and unoriginal writing. In terms of Poirot, um, I am not in any way trying to write in Agatha Christie's voice or to channel her voice. In fact, one thing I was clear about right from the start is that 
I don't believe one writer can or should try to mimic the writing voice or style, the writing voice or the prose style of another writer. I don't think it can ever work. I think your, your voice and your style as a writer, it's like your fingerprint, it's completely unique. Um, so I was very clear from the start that I am not writing new Agatha Christie novels, and I am certainly not writing as Agatha Christie or in her voice. All I'm doing is, I mean, I'm certainly writing Agatha Christie brand novels, but that's very different from writing Christie novels. So what I'm doing is writing new novels in which Agatha's detective Hercule Poirot is the star attraction. Um, and I saw my job as basically to be creating new and challenging and brilliant and exciting mysteries that Poirot, that Agatha Christie's Poirot could then solve. And so the way I got around the voice thing, because I didn't want people to think this is someone trying to write a Christie novel in yeah. Christie's voice and getting it wrong. So what I decided to do was create a new narrator and sidekick for Poirot, Inspector Edward Catchpool. So he is the narrator of all four of my Poirot novels so far. And he's also working with Poirot on all these murder mysteries. And that to me seemed like a brilliant way to deal with the fact that it was a new voice and a new person writing about Poirot. Because if anyone reads my Poirots and thinks, these don't seem exactly like Christie Poirots in their tone, there's a sensible reason for that within the framework of the book, which is this is a new person talking about, writing about and working with Poirot. Thank you. It's really that's a really interesting, interesting approach there, because as you say, there have been some authors that have that have done exactly what you said you, you were guarded against doing. Um, and yeah, it, it, it often works. It often doesn't. Um, Basim, and um, mo moving on to your um, central character, what what was the reasoning behind him and what were your, you know, could you tell me a little bit about the attributes you wanted to give to him or that? came about organically? Well, I, I, I can sum up what I think uh, a crime fiction character protagonist needs to have with one word, uh, and that is likability. And that's, if you, if you want people to read a series and continue to read the series. Now, we have to be careful what we mean by likability. What I don't mean is someone lovable and warm and cuddly. Um, that's not what I mean at all. What I mean is, say you take the case of Burrow, for example, now, on the face of it, he's not a likable person. You know, he's quite superior minded uh, and he's quite curt and abrupt and he's got these quirks and mannerisms. But if you read, if you read enough Poro, you do fall in love with him and he becomes likable to you. And I think there's a lot of characters that um, can be a lot of different character attributes that can be fit underneath uh, that's that overriding characteristic of likability. So for me, Inspector Chopra, he is likable by the fact that he is an honest man in a very corrupt environment. And everybody knows that the Indian police service uh, has a reputation for dishonesty and bribery and corruption and the rest of it. So he stands as a, as a character who's different to that. He doesn't take bribes. He doesn't believe in the kind of things that people get away with in that society in which he operates. And that in itself gives him this inherent property of likability. But there's other things that small things like taking in this one year old baby elephant, even though he lives on the 15th floor of a tower block. Um, why would you do that? You can easily send him somewhere else, but his inherent goodness prevents him from doing that. So these kind of things, I think, under that banner of likability are the single most important attribute, uh, but likability defined as a way of creating a character that people want to spend more time with. Thank you, thank you. And um, I, I just love that you have an elephant as a sidekick in your novels. That's just like the most unique thing ever. Um, <laughs> Rachel, so, so your your long running series are um, your Eloise Norton novels. Um, could you tell me about what, what you think about the a central crime fiction um, character and how that plays into the characterization of um, Lou Norton? Yes. Um, I wanted, and I'm always interested in and committed to writing these fully realized people. And that means that they are not perfect. Um, they have blind spots. They uh, are interesting. They have bad habits. I want them all to be, you know, 
just like us. I really want them to be just like us because I don't want them to, I, I want every reader to see themselves in some part of a character. For Lou Norton, you know, she's strong and brave and she will take a bullet for anyone because that's who she is as a, as a detective. But she's also um, someone's daughter and she's someone's sister and she has marriage problems. And, you know, she is jaded about many things that are LA and even with the LAPD who she works for. So she still, you know, there are nicks in her. And with those nicks, you get to play, you get to have these, your, your characters have these conversations where everyone's kind of bringing in their baggage, but sometimes they're too polite to call people out on their baggage. Um, I want them to be complex, but relatable. And it was fun, you know, writing Lou Norton because I didn't know how she'd react to certain cases that I'd give, you know, the first being a young girl found in a condo hanging dead. She reacted different in that case than what she did in the last book where it was dealing with, you know, big mega rich churches and hoarding and gentrification. So through her, I got to, of course, you know, just talk about some social issues, which we talked about earlier, as well as figure out who this woman is and how the people around her would react uh, to her. Um, for they all fall down. It's interesting, Sophie was talking about not, she's not writing as Agatha Christie, she's writing, you know, something inspired by. And it's been interesting for me because, you know, there have been some readers who are like, well, that's not an Agatha Christie book. And it's like, I never said I was writing as Agatha Christie. It's it's inspired by it, but there's no way I could, as a you know, a black woman in Los Angeles, California, would ever want to write as Agatha Christie. And you know, Miriam is not the typical Agatha Christie character in the first place. She's a woman of a certain age. She's divorced. She's um, kind of petty and 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 funny in that way. And some you talk about likability. Some people may not like her because she's. I would see her on the Real Housewives of Los Angeles type of show. She's, you know, a character, but we all have that one friend who can be totally inappropriate sometimes, but they're great at cocktail hour, you know, and Miriam's that type. And whether you like that or not, that's, you know, a subjective thing, but she's honest. Um, she loves her daughter. She can't understand why she's on an island, even though some of us, would like to put a lot of people on islands and send them away. But, you know, she's, again, she's a very uniquely American character and an African-American character who, you know, I have her and six other people put through the ringer, Agatha Christie style. And, you know, it was a blast doing that, taking something again, very English and turning it into some crazy Americans on a Mexican island somewhere. <laughs> it's great. It's great. It's really, really, um, I mean, all of your books are, are, are fantastic and um, really enjoyable reads. Um, I want to move on to the idea of the who done it or the why done it or the how done it. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to read a quote from Poirot here. Um, he says in one of <clears throat> pardon me he says in one of one of the books, every one of you in this room is concealing something from me. So it seems to me um, it seems to me that the that crime fiction is as much about secrets as it is solving a mystery and how those secrets reveal the um, maybe not very nice character, um, well, the, the darker side of characters and um, beneath the facade. So alongside, you know, you're finding out who, who committed the crime, who committed the murder, the rest of it. You're also finding out things about characters that aren't related necessarily directly to the crime as well. I'm interested in, this idea of a whodunit and secrets as well, and how they play into each other. And Rachel, I wonder if you could if you could um, speak on that a little bit as a as a theme of crime fiction. All every story I write, everyone has a secret, and I love it because, as you just said, it may not relate to the crime, but it colors every answer you give someone. Like right now, you know, you have no idea what I'm hiding back here in my hair. Like, like there's a, a safety pin on my shirt or something like that. And I'm very aware of it, 
but you may not know, but I won't turn like this because you may see it. And I want every one of my characters to have that little thing they're holding back. And so they're either scared of it being revealed or they'd be embarrassed. It may not be a life-threatening one, but again, it colors every interaction you have with someone else. And I think for crime fiction authors, we need those secrets just one, to help us figure out who these characters are, even if they're on the, on the page for a minute. It also drives the narrative of re the red herring. It's like, oh, I can tell she's kind of not answering 100%. Maybe she could have done it. And as a writer, that makes me excited. That's like my third draft when I get to do that kind of art where you're, you're shaving things and, and making little divots in people. But yeah, everybody has to have a secret, even if it's I have a poppy seed in the, my back molar and you can't see it, but I kind of taste it and <laughs> it's driving me crazy. And so I just want to end this interview because I want to dig in my tooth to get the seed out. So, yeah, those I love secrets. Please, please stay with us. Please, please don't end the interview. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And um, Vasim, how about, how about you? How, how do secrets play into to your writing and, and crime fiction from your point of view? I, th I think uh, secrets are a, a, a part of the human condition. All of us have secrets and usually they're very minor secrets, you know, some, some white fib that we may have told our partner or, or our kids or, or whoever, our colleagues at work. What crime fiction does, I think, is take a magnifying glass and exaggerate those secrets to the point that they become toxic and malicious and give the reader the impression once they discover these secrets that this person could have been capable of of murder and i think throughout if you're going to write crime fiction then you have to really find out which secrets can be exaggerated in that way and still retain some sense of uh, you know possibility or, or realism uh, sometimes I'll read a, cri a crime fiction novel and there'll be a twist which reveals a secret and I just want to throw the book at the wall because it makes no sense whatsoever. It's just totally, totally beyond the pale. But the very best crime novels manage to do to reveal those secrets in, in, a, in a way that seems seems completely realistic to us. And, so, and the other thing to note is that you have secrets which are at a very personal level, but also you have secrets that can be um, told uh, at, a, at a higher level. So, for instance, the, the, I'm writing a second series now set in 1950 in India, and it introduces India's first female detective. Uh, the first book is called Midnight at Malabar House. And Persis, the detective, while she's, inve she's investigating the murder of a senior British diplomat, uh, because a lot of Brits were still living in, in Bombay after independence. And this man is, t is uh, fated by the Indian government. But as she investigates, she begins to find not only secrets that are personal to him and his lifestyle, but also secrets pertaining to the work that he was doing at a higher level for the Indian government. Now, the way that you reveal and entwine those secrets leads to the, the, the mystery element that Sophie was talking about earlier, trying to keep that intellectual interest and challenge going for the, uh, for the reader right till the very end when you hopefully have this big reveal. That's, that's interesting. I think uh, you're right. We, we do all in real life have secrets, but it's, it's um, how those secrets kind of, you know, if we were thrust into a crime drama of our own, how, how would those secrets affect our, our outcome? <laughs> but Sophie, how, how about you and how, how, how do secrets and um, lies, I suppose, as well, play into the, the crime fiction genre from your point of view? Well, I mean, secrets are absolutely essential because if nobody felt the need to be secretive about anything, then every murder mystery would be very short. The detective would arrive and say, who murdered this dead body? And the murderer would go, it was me. Let me explain why. I always think I'd be a terrible murderer because I'm very indiscreet. If I've done whatever I've done, you know, whether it's something nice or a murder, I always want to tell everyone about it. So um, one of the things that I think, you know, those of us who are really familiar with the genre, you start to see all these potentials for parodying the genre and one of them that I've often thought would be hilarious to do as a parody is to write a murder mystery where nobody's keeping any secrets everyone's just very honest very open 
<laughs> and so the detective arrives and they all go, sit down, we will tell you everything that <laughs> they just do. Um, but yeah, I mean, secrets are, are, you know, the driving force of crime fiction. In fact, crime fiction is much more about secrets than it is about crime. Because so much of the genre, you know, if you were interested, let's say you were interested in, in crime fiction from a criminology point of view, there'd be whole swathes of crime fiction where you wouldn't learn that much about actual crime because um, more crime writers are interested in psychological stress and human relationships and mystery and secrets and all of that good stuff. And I think for a lot of us, certainly for me, the crime part is the part I'm least interested in. If I could find a way to make it high stakes enough that people would be desperate to find out without writing about murder, then I probably would, because I'm not actually <laughs> that interested in murder in and of itself. And one of the things I, I do in all my books is I always think, OK, somebody needs to die. That's clear. I'm not particularly interested in murdering them in an interesting way. So you will notice that a lot of my murder victims are very boringly killed. They're either stabbed or shot, whatever gets them dead most efficiently and involves me in the least research about crime. And then I have more time and space to focus on what I'm really interested in, which is what do people want other people never to know about them? And what aspects of our, because the thing about secrets is, Yes, it is all about what we don't want other people to know. But when we don't want someone else to know something about us, it's because we don't want to know that about ourselves. It's like our own sense of psychological survival is only possible if we kind of pretend we're not the real us, but some better version. And that pretense can't happen anymore once everyone knows that you've killed the butler and hidden his body in the coal shed you know so yeah I think secrets are absolutely fundamental to crime fiction well I, I love I love how you said about um wanting to write a novel where everybody just can't help but tell the truth I think that would be fantastic um, and it leads me on in a way I suppose to the challenges of writing crime fiction and by challenges I mean I mean in a twofold way um it's a it's a genre that has a a very rich history with some very, especially in the, in the English language, some very well-known, you know, big beasts of the genre in terms of the writers and also the characters you alluded to in Inspector Morse before, but then also, you know, I, I probably get um, um, a lot of aggro here, but I believe um, it, it began with the Moonstone and Wilkie Collins, although I think there've been a few short stories beforehand. And then obviously Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes. Um, what, because of this huge legacy, what challenges are the writing uh, crime fiction nowadays? And on top of that, what are your pet hates? And Vaseem, I'm, I'm going to go to you first for that one. Well, I work in uh, in a in a crime uh, research uh, centre, so the biggest challenge uh, nowadays is, of course, the level of technology that we have available to solve crimes. Uh, it's very difficult if you're going to set your your crimes in a very modern environment to avoid the fact that, say, London, for instance, is the most uh, CCTV surveilled uh, mm -hmm. city on earth. Um, so it's very difficult to say that nobody saw anything because it's uh, it's, uh, it's usually captured on camera somewhere and DNA analysis, all of these other tools that we have now and increasingly artificial intelligence and the way that draws together links between various clues and bits of evidence and networks of criminals means that it really is a lot more difficult for you to portray a plot when where the, 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 the people who are investigating it know absolutely nothing and then have to do all of the, the the shoe leather and the in interrogations, etc. But for me, I think that's um, that's one of the the beauties of, of or the challenges of trying to write really good crime fiction because what you do is you put yourself back in your readers' uh, point of view. Do readers really want a long, you know, essay on the the on CCTV or the brilliant new techniques that are out there, or do they really just want a character, characters that they can spend time with, a really good mystery, fully realized characters, uh, as we heard earlier. And do they then want to be able to revisit those characters, particularly if you're writing a series, revisit you as an author, because they trust you. They trust that you're going to deliver 
a good story that occupies their time in a meaningful way. And as far as bugbears are concerned with the uh, crime fiction, I think I hinted at it earlier, and that's the, the industry, and I understand why they do this, because it's marketing, it's advertising, but you know, you end up seeing 30 or 40 books a year advertised as the greatest twist that you have ever come across, the unanticipated, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the most shocking thing that you've ever seen. And that's fine. I understand why it's done, but it's usually not true. Usually you can see the twist coming. Usually it's, it's far from shocking or unanticipated. But what's great about crime fiction is that occasionally you will come across a fantastic book where you could not see it coming and that floors you and then you just cannot help but start talking uh, about that book to everybody and saying you must read this fantastic crime novel I've just come across. Thank you um, and Rachel I'll, I'll move on to you but just um, Rachel and Sophie with the caveat that we are getting close to the end of um, our time now but um, what, what do you Rachel what are your um, pet hates and also what are you, the challenges that you think the genre faces? The challenge right now, um, especially in America, is inclusivity. I mean, in, uh, crime fiction tends to be very white, very male. And we're now changing that because, you know, Black folks are more than just criminals in, in the world. So making this genre more criminal, I mean, uh, more, more inclusive. And fortunately, with so many stories to tell, we can go back and tell those stories, but from different perspectives. Um, the biggest challenge right now is how we're portraying police. Police, especially in America, have always been the heroes. And we know now that they have some issues. And how are we going to reflect um, not just dishonest cops, but cowardly cops, um, uh, cops who have who are not altogether upstanding and honorable? And how are we going to reflect that now in, in our writing? Because we now know that they do cheat and they do steal and they are dishonest. So that's going to be interesting in how, you know, this pandemic is going to play out in crime fiction. That'll be interesting too, as people are trapped in homes where, you know, there are abusive spouses and abusive parents. And how is that going to reflect in, you know, society? And then of course, in literature. Uh, yeah, but I think it's, it's interesting thinking about the, the pi pandemic si side of things and the next generation of writers and their influence. And yeah. um, Sophie, how, how about you? What are the challenges that you think the genre faces? Um, I think the challenge, the, the, the overwhelming challenge the genre faces as probably the most popular fictional genre is to keep coming up with ways to be new and unique and write crime novels where readers will read it and go, even though I've read a million crime novels, this is completely fresh and unique, which links to one of my bugbears, which is lack of originality. I read so many crime novels where I'm like, oh, this kind of thing again, which I'm not keen on. My other bugbear, which I'm actually quite fond of, and it's given me an idea for one of my other parody ideas. So for ages, it seemed that every crime novel I read started with a phone call from a person from the past. So protagonist in the present would be having a lovely time, you know, opening the fridge and getting out some orange juice, 2.4 kids and a lovely husband. The phone rings and they pick up the phone feeling very jolly and say hello. And someone on the other end of the line goes, hello. And it's the person from the past with whom you committed a murder 20 years ago. <laughs> And for ages, every novel I read started like that. And I have the burning desire to write a, a sort of satire of that subgenre where when the person from the past says hello in an ominous and threatening way, the protagonist in the present goes, oh, hi, it's you. Hey, remember that murder we committed? Look, I've been telling my husband all about it. You must come over for dinner so that we can all discuss <laughs> the murder. We, we could totally take the wind out of the sails of the person from the past. <laughs> so that was one of my bugbears for a while, but I, I haven't come across as many of those person from the past novels recently. I absolutely love that. That's great. You have to do your parody parody novels. Um, one final question, and it has to be, I'm afraid, a really quick answer. So if you could give the title and a sentence, why? Um, your favourite Christie novel and why? Um, Sophie, I'll start with you. 
I'm going to go for Murder on the Orient Express because I believe it has the cleverest misleading the reader and then solution in all of crime fiction. And Vasim? Uh, it's a short story that she wrote, The Adventure of the Egyptian Tomb, and I think it was filmed with David Suchet. And I love that because Poirot gets to go to Egypt and fool around with the tombs, and I have uh, a huge love for Egyptology. So. And Rachel? And then there were none. People on an island, very creative ways of killing them, and then that ending, oh my God, that ending. Vasim, Sophie, Rachel, thank you ever so much for your time. Thank it's been you. a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us from wherever you may be for this evening's event. We hope that it's deepened your enjoyment and appreciation of Agatha Christie. It certainly has for us. Please do let us know what you thought of tonight's event by visiting the feedback form by clicking the tab at your top of the page. We hope to see you again soon in person or if not online. Thank you. <laughs>